Welcome to my talk. I'm really glad for those of you guys can join. Uh, I'm really excited to be doing this with Sean and Infinite Painter. Peter Paul! I have to give a special shout out. He's one of my best friends. For those of you who don't know him, take his storyboarding class at Society of Illustrators. He's one of the best mentors I know out there. Um, so definitely take his class if you are not in LA or you are in LA. Um, yeah, it'd be really cool to, if you guys could, as you guys come in to type where you guys are from, I always love to hear what internet, uh, how international the group is. I know I have one of my mentorship students here. I'm going to give a shout out to Anne, who is one of my mentorship students. So Anne from Australia, I saw you type something. Um, um, I have Toronto too. Awesome. Okay. Um, cool. Um, yeah. Yes. We'll just so, yeah, I was gonna, if you don't mind, I'm just gonna go ahead and introduce myself too, and then yeah, let, go let, for it. Take the stage. Yeah. So I am Sean Brakefield, uh, creator and developer of Infinite Painter, um, and yeah. So we just fell in love with Tiffany's work right after the first Lightbox um, event, which was you know in person. So can't wait for that to kind of gear up again. But yeah, um, yeah, Tiffany's just amazing, amazing artist, and we're really like, honored just to be sharing the stage with her. And so I'll let you take over, but if you guys have any questions at all, um, just throw them in the chat and I'll try to answer them or bring to Tiffany's attention throughout the demo. Yeah, thanks so much, Sean. Um, it's an honor to be working with you as well. I'm, I must say, um, like John said, just to give a little uh, uh, backdrop of how I got to collaborate with Infinite Painter. Uh, we met at Lightbox two years ago. I want to say last year, but last year I wasn't even at Lightbox. So two years ago in the in-person one, and I think they came up to me. <laughs> and I remember th sort of thinking, oh, I can't, you know, honestly, I don't really, never really painted in, in apps before that, to be honest. Um, so I was like, oh, this is probably like another thing, you know, they're just trying to get artists or something. Um, so that's so because and, and so, but then once they gave me the app and started playing around with it, I just fell in love with the app truly. And Sean has been a joy to work with. Like they really care about the artists and um, who they're working with. And like I said, this custom brush pack that I'm so excited to share with you guys, um, he made those brushes. Like I told him what my, my top brushes would be. So I'm actually gonna be starting off this talk explaining the brushes. Um, and I'm just, it was just, I was over the moon with them. So I'm so excited to be sharing them with you guys. Um, this is like my essential pack. Uh, so yeah, Tiffany's core essential brushes, I think Sean just shared it with everyone. So for you guys who are in this talk, you guys are gonna get the whole gist of why I like these brushes, right? Because there are so many brushes out there. There's so many things you can download. I personally am so lazy that I just use whatever people give me. I'm very lazy when it comes to this. That's why when it comes to gouache painting, I use just a flat brush and a round brush. That's it. When it comes to, when I actually started off in um, Infinite Painter and I can actually, ha, huh, I can show you all my beginning works. How cool. Okay, so this is basically, you guys can see the gist of all my work. This was the very first painting I did with my fingers um, on Infinite Painter and I just fell in love with it. Just after the still life, I was like, oh my gosh, it's just, there, ha there has this tactile um, hand painted quality that I, that I struggle actually to get with a lot of apps, which is why I don't digitally, I never really digitally plain air painted before this. And that is the truth. I would gouache plain air, of course, for those of you guys who know my work, I gouache, I'm a gouache and digital painter. Um, so I'm not gonna open all of these, but you guys can kind of see, um, you know, the little thumbnails and, and stuff. So. Um, so when I first started off in Infinite Painter, I was just doing the grunge fill tool. So um, it is in my core path right here. Um, this was one of the first, and I'm actually painting my finger right now. So um, this was one of my first, first brushes that I fell in love with um, for the reason that I could create any shape that I wanted with a little bit of texture. And that was just mirroring marrying the best two worlds for me. Uh, I, I did paint like this in Photoshop. So um, for those of you guys who don't know my day job, I'm a production designer at Cartoon Saloon. I also teach, I was teaching full-time mentorships as well as that. And now I'm taking a break because it was just, it was a lot, um, but I love my job right now. Um, and actually the thing I'm teaching right now, thumbnails is actually hand in hand with what I do for my job, basically creating the whole look for the whole TV series through color keys and mood boards, um, as well as more refined scene illustrations. 
Um, so I love my job so much and painting small and understanding the concept of why it is important to paint small and understand how to see better is really integral um, to, to you know, any job that you might apply for. Um, and I got hired, I think, specifically because of that, um, which is cool. So um, anyways, I digress. That's just a quick bio about myself. But you guys, I don't want to talk about myself. So um, anyways, this was the first tool that I used. And then the second tool that I fell in love with, not this brush, the second tool that I fell in love with was the smudge tool. Okay. And you can see a little bit of a difference when I'm using the my finger versus the pen. I started off painting with my finger because I didn't... Um, I, I didn't have a pen. And actually, when I first got a pen, I was very resistant to the pen. I thought, no, I'm going to stick with my finger. Um, but I like these two brushes for two reasons, okay? The grunge fill tool lets you get those hard edges and those really graphic shapes that I need. Now, the palette knife tool is like my all-in-one smudge brush. And so that lets me lose edges. And the whole thing of simplifying and painting small is knowing how to balance your hard edges and your small edges, your shapes, and your merging, okay? Any of you guys who take my mentorships, you guys should know this. Simplifying is synonymous, I believe, with knowing where to merge your shapes and where to have those crisp edges. That is how you create that ooh -la -la kind of look of um, the light hitting something where you have a crisp edge and then things going in shadow is typically my rule where um, you, you will lose um, you, you will merge those shapes together, right? Um, so those were the two brushes that I, that I started off with. Now, what's not in this, and I didn't have time to delve it before, um, but I have it in my favorites, is, um, hmm, do I have it anymore? Oh, that's strange. I don't have it. Um, oh, here it is. That's the Stucco. Oh, the Stucco. So um, this is another brush that, that I like um, that just throws a little bit of texture. So I was basically using these three brushes. That's it. People would always ask me, what brushes are you using on Infinite Painter? Um, and it was always those three. So for example, this one that became, oh, not the project, um, that became a really popular one. Um, this was just basically using, you can see my references and everything. This was basically using those three brushes. Um, so you can see if I zoom in where I have my hard edge. Oh, let me turn on the touch. I'm sorry, hold on guys. Um, sure touches. Okay, so right here, you could see right there. Oh, that's cool. Um, you know, I have my hard edges where the light is hitting. Everywhere in shadow, you know, where I have right here, uh, maybe even right here, there's some softer edges, which I just use a palette knife. Um, so this is a, a good example of that one. Now, going back to, um, you know, my, my messy board, um, those are the three brushes. Now, what is in the core pack, and I'll talk about each of them, is... Um, the shape jump tool, which um, I'm, I love so much. And Sean made this custom. And this, this came into, you see, if I drag on, you're creating all this kind of subtle jitter and different shapes. And it's so much easier to do photo than in Photoshop. It's just amazing how much faster it is. But it just, if you guys see, it gives you a subtle hue jitter, but not so much that it changes the value. And this is what I like to add almost as finishing touches at the end of a painting to add a little bit of um, color variety or color interest and color pop. Um, so you can see, I'll drag my hue. So if I take any color, you can see that it just gives a little bit of that, a little bit of line circle and, um, and squares and a little bit of shift in the yellows and oranges. So this is called shape jump. And I love this again to just break up those shapes a little bit more when you have really graphic shapes. I just to add a little bit of oh noise, that's the word, okay? Um, this is another brush that I love because if I press lightly, you can see, um, it, it, it almost gives a little bit of spray. And this is great for blending certain shapes. If you want, you know, really subtle um, noise that will blend two shapes. If I press a little bit harder, you can start to see that it basically creates a block. Okay. And if I just minimize it a little bit and it just, I just love the way it tapers out at the end. Um, so this is called textured block. And this is great for blocking in big shapes while getting a little bit of texture at the end. Um, Next is Indian ink. And this is almost, I, I like to call it my calligraphy. So my calligraphy you can see if I zoom in a little bit, it does also have a texture. The lighter I press, the more coarse it is. So I can really just create beautiful textured lines, great for trunks. Oops, sorry. 
I'm trying to um, just make it smaller. Great for trunks, you know, I can make it really not that small. Um, you know, get really thin textured coarse lines. If I press harder, it starts being thicker. You can see how, um, you know, you could play a lot with that as well. Um, palette knife already showed that, grunge filter already showed that. Now slanted heart, this is like the really basic of basic, right? So slanted heart, I'll just go ahead and continue on this. Let's pick a red color. I actually picked this up during working at Cartoon Saloon and I actually used to just use the hard brush, but there's something about, you can see the slanted brush, it's just a solid brush. And I think this is really essential for any, um, in the core pack because you need that shape that can get you that you don't have you don't fuss with texture at all sometimes it's really easy to get caught up with texture and then your whole painting becomes very textury and it becomes very oversaturated with noise and you need this one brush to sort of calm you down and bring you back to those basic shapes like i said i'm you can see i'm tilting my arm this way and that and i can get a thin line as if i barely touch it i mean i'm basically dancing right um and I love this brush for, honestly, when I do color keys at work, I'm using this brush. I'm using a textured brush and this brush, and that's it. It's very simple. You don't need a lot of brushes. Um, so it's, this brush is almost like another calligraphic brush that is like a no, if I were to rename it, I would call it the no fuss brush. Just helps you get those big graphic shapes. And last but not least, Proko's brush. Um, I found that I love this brush for sketching. So I'm going to show you how I use this. Uh oh, why is it not? Oh, haha, I'm on the wrong layer. Um, you can see how if I press almost like it looks like charcoal, but then I can really also get nice, delicate, thin lines. So if I want to shade a little bit, this is like my digital sketching mode. Um, so if I, if I, uh, one of my personal goals actually is to be able to um, go out and, and actually ske sketch one of my Achilles heel. Is that the right word is I don't sketch it up. I know that for myself. Um, I know that because I'm a decent painter, if I were to sketch, it wouldn't be like back at ground zero, but I know that to be a good painter, you need to also be a good sketcher. And one of the main problems I see with students is that they don't sketch enough. And that shows in their lack of foundation when they do color and they paint with color because their structure and their design design is, um, is, 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 is uh, lacking. So drawing will definitely help you with that. So this is, I count as my drawing. So if I want to create little thumbnails, you know, no problem. You know, I can just really quickly just, you know, scribble in, you know, something really loose and I can just, whatever that is, you know, a tree um, and really get some nice um, delicate lines, but also shade in as well. Um, so these are seven right here. Um, honestly, I don't know if I need this to go, but that would be like an added bonus, which would make it eight. Um, like I said, Sean has sent you guys an updated pack, but I'm just going to work with the seven today. Um, but again, that's shape junk, textured block, Indian ink, palette knife for smudging, grunge fill tool, which is the brush that I actually usually start off a painting with, slanted hard and proco pencil. Um, some of these were already in the in, in the program right in the app and some of these we made so um uh oh so how do i access my my project that i just made is it this one oh it's this one okay great okay so now going to the you know thumbnails and everything right this whole demo is about thumbnails and um i wanted to just go over some specific points of why I like painting in thumbnails so much. These are the images I'll be getting through. I don't know if I'll get through all of them. I never practice my images ever beforehand, my demo, because I don't like to become stale. So you're seeing me figure out problems on the fly. All my mentorship students know this. And so it becomes very fun for, and challenging for me. Um, nothing is ever rehearsed. So if you see me figuring out something, that is really me figuring out something on the spot because that's how painting is, right? It's it's not staged, you know, that's the beauty of creativity and the beauty of being able to go in plein air and be bombarded with, um, you know, problems that you have to solve and painting a lot is problem solving. And number one problem solving thing you have to figure out over color is value and design, right? And that's something that I think is usually not stressed enough because I think a lot of people like to focus on um, color, color, color and light, which is of course, really fun and really fun to, um, you know, the juicy part, but a lot of times painting can lack in design. So I'm going to try my best to 
talk about that. Um, but I also wanted to really quickly give a shout out to Sean again for making this awesome template that is um, available to all you guys. It makes painting thumbnails so much easier on the fly. And I mean, I know I'm gonna be using this when I'm traveling. Um, so yeah, why is it so important to paint small? I get this question a lot and I can't stress enough um, why it's so valuable. And so the number one thing why I think doing thumbnails is there's, I mean, there's so many different things, but of course you've probably heard this before. It helps you simplify. Okay. I cannot stress this enough. We, as humans, we want to overthink and overwork things. I'm guilty of that all the time. You know, a lot of times what I'll do is I will sometimes purposely or unknowingly overwork something. That's why I like to work in layers so that I can um, or duplicate my layers so I can almost see my progress. So I actually work, I actually paint digitally like I paint traditionally as in I, I, I will merge everything, I paint everything in one layer, but I'll duplicate that whole layer then paint on that. So then I turn off my layers, you can actually see progress, but I will not paint the foreground, background and midground on separate layers. It will all be on one layer, especially for thumbnails because you don't, the last thing you wanna do is obsess, last thing I wanna do is obsess over every layer and where, that is hiding. That drives me absolutely nuts. Um, so, um, so, so that's the number one uh, way. Was so simplifying, right? You know, looking at your your reference images is small, or if you're in plain air, squinting, right? That is the number one thing you can do. This helps you be able to focus on the big shapes and also focus on what is in the shadow and what is in the light. That is always the first step on how I approach any painting. What is in the shadow? What's in the light? If you don't have that figured out, you're probably lost for the rest of your painting. If you're going to go in your painting blind and be like, oh, I'm just going to think and pick that color without knowing where your light direction is coming from, um, what ratio of your painting is in shadow and light, you're probably going to uh, encounter design problems later and value problems, which are the number one things that are not going to make your painting read. And I can guarantee you three fourths of the times I see paintings online, it's suffering from design and value because um, color, really, you could choose any color. Um, so if it takes you a year to figure it out, you my best advice for you is to figure out and understand value first um, before you even try to tackle color. Um, understand how you can build up a painting from a matrix study, from three values, from four values. Understanding how to design from that before you even go into color. Okay, I'm not going to do value studies today, but I'll tell you what I'm what I'm thinking. Um, the second thing is, you know, time management, right? When you're out in the field or when you don't have a lot of time to paint, you know, thumbnail studies, timing yourself to 20 minutes, you know, is really valuable. Plus you can do four paintings in the span of an hour versus one painting. And if you are a beginner, that is probably my best recommendation for you because when you're a beginner, quantity is more than better than quality. Your best bet is to churn out more paintings and learn from them instead of spending and tunnel visioning yourself on one painting and obsessing over um, getting it right. You're not gonna learn as much. I would say 45 minute window is max for any painting, you know, no matter the size, right? I'll spend any time from 10 minutes to 30 minutes on a thumbnail maybe 30 minutes to an hour on a larger painting or less. It depends. You know, we all have our good and good, good and bad painting days. Uh, but timing yourself to, you know, maybe doing a daily four set of thumbnails for an hour, 20, 15 minutes per each. Stop whenever it's 15 minutes. Assess where you got to. That is way more valuable than trying to do a finished painting. Of course, some days you can challenge yourself, be like, okay, I'm going to sit and now marinate in the painting. And I think that back and forth um, dialogue with letting yourself melt in a painting and also training yourself to time yourself is really valuable exercises. Um, so time management is great. When I don't have a lot of time, I will do two by two gouache studies or thumbnail studies. Actually, I didn't really do, <laughs> to be honest, this is a really ironic thing. I give my students thumbnail studies, but I, I don't really do them until this template came out. So that's a confession I have to make. Um, so, uh, but I'm fast anyways, but now I will be doing them. I'm going on a trip to Iceland. And funny enough, these pictures are from Iceland, except for the bottom right one. Um, my friend went there and she sent me these and I wanna paint them. So I'm going there in October. Um, so yeah. Um, uh, time management. And then another thing is um, you, you, you really focus on 
I think you really heighten up your, your sense of um, edge control in a thumbnail study. Because if a thumbnail study has too many soft edges, it's going to, you know, basically become unreadable because it's already small. But if you know how to balance your uh, your hard and soft edges, which is something I'll be talking about, um, you will be uh, you'll be able to see if a painting is readable through value and edges through a thumbnail. Um, I will. Yeah, thumb I will. Yeah. I was going to say there was this actually relates to a question that was asked a bit earlier. Um, but yeah, I said, do you ever overlay the original image on top of your painting to accentuate the edge? Um, no, I never overlay a painting. I never, I never paint on top of a photo. It'll just be like a reference like this. That actually throws me off more. Um, so this is how I always work, how you see the references right now. And then how I paint like this, that's how I work. But I'll never import a photo directly into the image, which I know is an option. Um, but that's not how I work because what I find when you do that is that you become too reliant on the photo. You start going back to the photo all the time and you stop making your own creative choices. At least that's what happens to me. So I hate yeah. it when that happens to me and I never do that because I just become, I almost fall back too much on the photo, right? And you're like toggling back and like, oh my God, am I, am I matching the photo? It's like, why do you have to match the photo? Does, how does it look in front of your eyes? right here. And that's why as a thumbnail, if you're not sure if your painting is reading, if you're not doing a thumbnail, you're not sure your painting is reading, zoom out like this. If it doesn't read, it's, it's something's off. Also, you can take a picture that works better for traditional things because you don't want to take a picture of your screen. Um, but I will always zoom out like this. And you'll probably, when I work on Photoshop, I work like this. Like this is probably the size I work on a painting. Sometimes I'll zoom up like this. Most of the time I'm like this. For color keys, I'll work like this. So wow. I work very small. Um, so for the sake of the, the reference, ooh, I just need a dot. Um, maybe I should have imported them all separately, but I didn't think about that, but that's okay. Um, so I did a lot of talking. Okay, so um, yeah, let's go ahead and get started. So I'm gonna start on the, I guess the top left. Um, so what I, let me start off with what I when I what I see when I see this. So um, I see that it's mostly in shadow, this painting, and I will start off very abstract. Okay, and oftentimes, I actually like my paintings more <laughs> in, the, in the beginning when they start. So I know that this part's in light, but I know that this whole part. And honestly, half the time, I know I say, pay attention to your shapes. That's what I always tell my students: shapes, shapes, shapes. I, the last thing I want to do is focus on being tight and accurate um, when I start off. I want to let myself have freedom. I want to let myself slap down shapes. I know it's almost counterintuitive when I, because I tell my students, pay attention to your shapes, what shapes you're putting on. And I, and I do do that. And I, and I, when I do refine later on in the beginning though, honestly, if I'm really thinking about myself, I'm just, I'm going by intuition. I'm just bam, bam, bam. I don't think too much because what you want to do is let your heart guide you. Um, and so, so, you know, whatever is happening right now, um, I'm focused. What I am noticing is that I'm, I, I love these smaller shapes right here. Oops. What am I doing? Um, forgive me if I'm a little bit rusty. I have not painted for myself in a while. Another confession. Um, so so um, I'm just putting on abstract shapes right now. This is kind of a that funky rock in the in the in the foreground there is going to throw me off a little bit. But you see, what I'm trying to do first and foremost is um, actually match value. So right now I'm using the grunge fill tool. Actually, what I'll do is I'll just fill this out completely. Um, I'm using the grunge fill tool, and I just I love to see that how the abstractness um, feeds in. Um, I'm also figuring out the light coming from the top, topish right somewhere. Oh, my screen just sort of did this weird thing. Um, this might look a little bit funny. Um, and I'm probably gonna be painting this in one layer. And again, when I'm bombarded with complex things like this, um, I'm not thinking of like this, I chose I chose these images because I wanted to um, paint them, but then I realized later, oh, it's like land, water, um, sky and buildings, which are like all my arch nemesis. I hate painting rocks and I hate painting buildings and skies are really hard. Um, trees are probably the easiest because <laughs> they're organic. 
Um, so again, I'm sorry if I suck, guys. Uh, I'm just figuring this out as much as you are watching me. Um, but like I said, again, I'm putting down all these heart shapes. This grunge fill tool is um, letting me put down all these shapes. And some of the reason why you, it's actually really cool to be able to see my painting because now I'm looking at my painting on my math. I can see if the values are working or not. And that's very helpful for me. Um, might throw in a little bit of red in the shadows a little bit. Um, just all kind of thinking like red here and those sort of shadowy rocks. This is so Irishy and Iceland. I just can't wait to see these landscapes when I go there. Something that I don't see a lot, right? Um, now, I, I, what I do, and this was my method for the longest time. Um, let's add a little bit of sky there. Am I not even? <laughs> let's see if I end up using those other brushes because I'm going to fall my crutch again. Um, uh, um, I, I'll, I'll do a block in like this. And then very quickly, what I'll do is I will sometimes what I'll do is, is it possible to duplicate this layer, Sean? Uh, yeah, you can just, uh, just press it, duplicate it. It'll create the same mask and everything too, so. Okay, so, uh oh, oh, oh no. Not the right. Okay, so um, after I'll put these, you know, these harsh layers on, I'll smudge everything. And I wanna talk about this concept a little bit of, of um, over smudging and then losing all your edges in order to bring them back. Um, it's a concept that my, um, actually I never went to his workshop, but for those of you guys who know um, Rule Lee, he's like a really cool oil painter. My friend went to his workshop and, um, and he said that he, he would do this. So he would paint, you know, for the students and he would do this beautiful oil painting of this way study. And then at the end of the workshop, he'd take a palette knife and just, you know, scrape off all the paint. That's when amazing. I first, yeah. And when, when my friend first told me that, and then the next day he, he would, he would go and paint again. I'm like, why the heck would he do that? He's like erasing his whole day's work. I didn't understand it until probably a year later when I realized basically my technique that I developed for myself is what I'm basically doing. You are putting non shapes and you're almost unlearning or undoing what you did in order to realize what you need, right? It's that backwards kind of philosophy that we need to, you know, it's not always a constant art is not linear, right? It's not a building. It's not constant building up. Sometimes you have to detract. Sometimes you have to always all my paintings. Okay. There's not one painting where it's like, Oh yeah, this is like linear. This is, you know, I'm building up. There's, um, the, the, the later layer is always better than the previous layer. Not once, not once have I ever done that. Always, always every my paintings is a combo of my beginning layers, my beginning stages where I love the spontaneity and then some of the later layers. And sometimes most of the time it might be most beginning. So I actually like to, that's why I like to duplicate my progress and I'll use masks on Photoshop and I'll actually erase some of my top layers to show my initial stages. So my final painting will be a combo of the end and the beginning of the beginning and the end right um so it's it's that concept that i find really fascinating right that that um ability to be able to not be afraid to um to erase your work right um you you have painting is very akin to um and actually what i'll also do you'll see me do now is um i'll probably hop onto another thumbnail once i get bored i get bored very easily um, so once I'd be like, oh, I don't feel like working on this anymore. I just hop on. That's another plus for thumbnails, right? You can just hop on to something else and be like, oh, and then the beauty of that is, it's not just because you're bored. I mean, sometimes, yes, it's because you can't figure it out. But the beauty of that is, is that when you leave a painting, um, you, uh, let's see, it needs to be more purple. Um, you, when you come back to it fresh eyes, it's almost like you're, you're, you're leaving it, but then you're not, you're actually just working on another painting. And that's, you know, like two birds in one stone. It happens to me all the time where I will jump to another painting. I'll look back and I haven't looked at my first one. Then I'll look back at my first painting and I'll be able to figure out what was wrong with it. You know? And um, the number one thing I like to say is when you're stuck, step away, you know, don't go get a snack, go take a walk, go read a book, do something other than art, you know? 
other things will give you answers. Um, it's not like art itself will always give you answers. It's actually a lot of times other things in life and enlarging your life experiences that will give you the answer to what you need. Um, so I find a lot of my answer in non-art books. Uh, I was actually thinking about this the other day and no one's actually asked me, asked me this, but if you were to ask me how much art um, I, uh, stuff I watch or read, it's like zero. <laughs> I'm a very in-person person, which I was telling Sean earlier. I, I need to actually be in person for a workshop um, or else I, I can't really concentrate, to be honest. Um, and so when it comes to online stuff, I, I kind of suck at that. Um, so I think there was a question that just jumped in, um, but then it disappeared. So I don't really, I want to make sure the chat's working for you guys. There was a question about whether there was a black and white shortcut to maybe view your values. Yes, there is, right? Yeah, there is. There's actually a few. I can point them out if you're interested or, um, you know, I think, th yeah. So there's one where you can actually turn the whole entire canvas into kind of a like value mode, essentially. So Tiffany, if you want to tap that, the furthest icon on that layer panel, the one that's like the multiple layers. Oh, yes. Um, and then you can change the color mode of that project. If you just scroll down. Grayscale. To grayscale. Yep. And then, so you'll be working right there in value mode and so, or grayscale mode. And so what's cool about this is um, that if you actually paint right now, um, you're actually painting still with color, um, but it's just showing you the values. And so anytime you sample colors or eye drop um, and you're still painting in full RGB color. And so we actually help with your decision making with values, especially with the color selector. So, yep. I have done a painting like this before and it was so fun. Um, I did a painting completely black and white and I didn't, I kind of had an idea of where the colors were on the color wheel, but you know, I would, you know, I, oops, I would go back here and then I go, you know, standard and you go, okay, your greens are here. I mean, I kind of memorized it. And then your colors turn out super wacky and you're like, oh my God, this is, Oh, if I can show the painting later. Um, but that's what I love about Infinite Painter. Sean is always coming up with just awesome ways. Like, I think it's one of the few apps that really care about learning um, because I'm a teacher myself and um, they just are com constantly coming out with all these cool things to, um, to really facilitate the student in, in learning. And so that's actually, I would highly recommend... Um, um, checking that out. Um, Thank you, Tiffany. And, and um, playing around with that because then you will see how color doesn't really matter. Like that, I love that app because you will start to see how you could choose any color. But if your values are working, it, it, it could it could look like a really cool sci-fi painting because maybe the colors aren't you know like normal to Earth, but it would still work value-wise, and that's the really fun part. Um, so. Um, right now I'm just doing that. I'm going to try actually a, um, I'm going to try this really quick and just play around with sort of like a yellowish, um, texture, throw that on really quick. So you can see how that's sort of throwing on some nice texture. And I like to play with greens. Uh, this is, a, I mean, it's a very green, green thing. Um, actually I'm going to throw in a little bit of warmth and a little bit of red. So it's not completely green, maybe throw in a little bit. So this is just a great way to sort of throw in a little bit of texture. Um, very tempted to use this shape jitter and almost put like a really deep purple. Um, ooh, that's too, that's too saturated. Um, so that's kind of cool. Um, so honestly, sometimes when you don't have control over your shapes, that's so fun. Like, I, I like these brushes because they give me a certain amount of control, but then it's like, sometimes you just can't, you know, you can't control it. So I'm going to, I'm going to come back to this wave a little bit later. Um, I'm just going to carve in uh, a few shapes. I'm going to, Sean, how long do I have an hour, right? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, we can always go a little bit over time. Um, so obviously, uh, you know, do it at your pace. Um, so there might be something else that people jump into, but, um, but yeah, I mean, we can stay as long as, as long as you like. Um, but right now time is at, uh, we have about 22 more minutes before, uh, okay. to the hour mark, if that helps. 
Okay. Um, yeah, obviously I would like to refine these water shapes a little bit more and get them more, you know, graphic, but, um, I'll have to, that will be something I'll, I'll figure out. Um, this one I'll example is where I'll use the Proco pencil to sketch first. So I'll take, you know, any pen and I'll just demo that, but you can see here, because I know this looks simple, but for some reason, I know I'm going to screw it up. Um, something with curves, like I'm not very good at doing. So like, I just want to plan out that. Sorry, give me one second. Ah, how do I? Okay. Um, so there's a hill here. Honestly, it's funny because there's a cliff here and then there's like these rocks, but to me, they all looked grouped and I'm very interested in the grouping of shapes um, and the high horizon line. So, um, sorry, give me one second. Okay. So um, I'm gonna just start off with another brush for fun, throw off my kind of typical way of painting. Oh, I just love this brush. Um, another kind of green. Now something about greens, okay? When I'm painting greens, um, I am never thinking in terms of one kind of green. I'm shifting between warm and cool and saturation. And that is the ticket that's going to give me a sort of interesting variety. So you can see, um, I talk about this, I, I've done videos of Proco um, and on my YouTube videos, but you can see how I am, ooh, I know what I'm going to do. Um, you can see how I'm just... Um, Sorry, my brain is like all oh, ahead of itself. I can't talk and paint at the same time because I'm like thinking of ideas. Well, um, I just really want to push this shadow more purple. I already know I'm going to screw up the composition. It's already screwing me over. Um, so <laughs> this stuff always. Um, I'm going to just block in that, that hazier rock in the back um, and push it just a kind of a beautiful gray. For those of you who know me, I love grays. And something about, so you can see the shape, this, this brush, it's a little bit harder for me to get um, harder graphic shapes, which I usually get with my grunge fill tool. But it's so fun to just be able to get texture. And I, I usually wouldn't start off with texture like this, but I'm gonna show you how I would then hone in um, um, the, like the shapes later on. So I'm gonna just block in using that. Um, and then, very quickly, if I go to the grunge fill tool, we can now, now that I have actually, yeah, okay. Um, now that we have our basic colors, we can start carving in. And this is a concept that I really like to um, um, espouse is sort of carving into your shapes and treating them, oh my, God, my iPad is really hot right now, and treating them like almost like you're sculpting um, think of it like you're sculpting into, um, into clay, right? So if you think of it as art being sort of, ah, actually cool, it's kind of cool like that. I'm not just leaving nice. it with that. Honestly, it's, this happens to me. Like, why do you need a refined painting? Ask yourself why, why can you just leave it? You know, I'm kind of breaking these sort of thoughts where people are like, I need to have a refined painting. If you like it, the way it looked with that spontaneity, go with your gut. A lot of times, you know, I have this, I, I do that and I go, no, it needs to be more refined. And then I just, and I overwork it. And that's when I, that's why I like to do it on multiple layers. I, I, honestly, I need to fix some compositional stuff. Like what I like is how these shapes, you know, kind of break off into smaller shapes to sort of delineate depth and scale, which is, they're just shapes. Okay. So another really important, um, you're getting like a crash course on what I teach in my mentorships, but another really important thing is um, being aware that every every um, stroke you put down is a shape. Actually, I have this on my Instagram. So, um, and and really thinking about that is is actually can radically change the way you approach, um, you know, a a painting. Oh, and a, something that I I, I want to bring up. You see that tone I have underneath, and Sean was really kind to. Um, be able to see that awkward shape I just put. Um, 
was really nice to be able to actually give give the burnt tone already like that um is I will leave the tone like that and like it's obviously clearly not in the painting but I actually really like it like that and the thing about the grunge fill tool is that I could tone down the oh no that's the size tone down the opacity and just that tone that red down a little bit I was like oh that's a little too red right so now I'm just I'm just toning down the red but I kind of want some of that tone to come through obviously I will shape these rocks later but because I have 15 minutes left we'll we'll kind of go back and do another another phase sorry I really don't like the shape of this waterfall so I'm gonna just um, do something um it's annoying me so uh, see this me yeah. Really quickly while you're working, um, uh, we did have a question here about which iPad you're using. One of the user, uh, one, of our, one of the uh, one of the participants was asking. Yes, I'm using a Pro uh, 11 inch. Okay, cool. And then actually, I was I wanted to point out as well while you're working too is like I actually love it how you didn't go straight into like black or white. Like you brought in just this kind of almost desaturated purple for the shadows and yeah. you, you typically try to retain the color when you're bringing in shadows is that important yes because um that's a that's actually you brought up a a really good point that um that i want to talk about um let's carve out this edge just a little bit more um and it's um in the photo like this right i didn't take this photo by the way uh but I know there'd be a lot more color in person. Um, the thing that I have, the thing with people painting from photos is that if they're not experienced in painting in plain air, they would probably paint this black, right? So if I put a new layer, can I put this, can I move this in the mask? Uh, can you move it where? Into the mask? Uh, you would have to uh, basically group those and then generate a new mask. I think that, oh, yeah, okay. that's something we'll have to add, honestly. Okay. Um, okay. like, um, so let's see, maybe I'll just duplicate this and then delete it. Right. Okay. So if I duplicate this, will the bottom one show? Yeah. Okay. So, oh, so, you know, someone who would, you know, they do something maybe like this, like they go, oh, that's gray. Usually the number one thing I see is people painting shadow is gray, you know, like something like that, which if the value is good, it will work. For some reason, I see red through there, but I don't know why that's happening. Um, it's definitely more gray, but they'll do something like this and they'll pick the back and they'll pick the back. It's the gray like that. And it works because I picked the value right. But, you know, in terms of shadow, you have to think about ambient light and bounce light, you know, that subtlety in the local color of the rocks, which is why I don't quite go to just straight. And I can, it doesn't mean that I don't use grays though. You know, I will use grays and, 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 and they're beautiful. And then those, more gray grays, you know, stand out beautifully with, um, with, with, with the, with the more vibrant colors that you have. Right. So, um, so it's, it's a matter of knowing how to balance those grays right now I'm going to complex color theory. Um, but yeah, I don't ever really use straight gray for the shadows. I always like to push, think about the ambient light, push it a little bit more blue. And then you can see here actually what it, if you can see, there's a little bit of warm on the top of that rock. And then, um, and then uh, let's just carve this a little bit more. So obviously with design wise, I'm not really doing that great on design because um, I'm rushing a little bit. And, but um, you know, I would really think about how to carve that unique kind of shape because these rocks are really, you know, unique to that without losing the spontaneity. Um, so that's something I was thinking about for that. Maybe add even a little bit more like yellow. Um, so I would go in with the textured block maybe. Actually, I'm gonna use a stucco because I think I'm really dying for that stucco. What do you guys have? Um, so with a stucco, I'll show you really quick. This is where I just, just splatter on a little bit of warm. You see just a little bit? Yeah, stucco, eight brushes. Bam, perfect pack, right? So this brush I love because it's like barely their texture. You can see just a little bit of that just adds a little bit of warmth to the painting. Now, stucco brush, I'm gonna use this for the last one because, um, or for the bottom left, because you're probably thinking, how is she gonna tackle, you know, something complex like that? I used to be able to be scared of tackling this kind of stuff. Um, not so much anymore because I trained myself to be able to see the big shape. So we can see the shadows casting um, 
And so the light is coming from the top left ish, right? Because the shadows are casting this way. Um, sorry, that was a weird noise. I made my mouth hurts. Um, oh, I'm in the wrong there. Okay, so. Uh, so I'm going to actually start with the stucco brush. I'm just showing you guys how I would start off differently. Oh, you know, you know what? Sorry. I'll start with the Proco brush because I need to plan out my stuff. Um, so this is a one where I would definitely just plan out really quick, like perspective, because I'm not the best at that. Um, I'm definitely going to crop out most of the bottom part. I always end up painting things like this way too big and then I'll have to adjust So I'm just getting a sort of quick, nothing, just planning out where the bay is, um, where this, and you know, typically when I'm on site, I won't spend more than like a minute or two sketching it out. Um, this actually needs to be higher. Actually, there's a weird tangent from this to this. So I'm actually gonna lower um, the house here a little bit so that there's not a tangent. So. You know, you don't need to copy the design fully, right? And there's some houses here. Anyways, I get the gist of it. So I'm gonna go back to the stucco brush, um, stucco roller, and I'm actually just gonna start throwing in this texture. The stucco roller has a little bit of, um, uh, a little bit of, oh, I just love this brush. This has to be in there, Sean. Um, and so it has a little bit of hue. Uh, which is, or sorry, hue jitter, which is, which is great. So the roof here is almost like gray. Um, so, I'm, so because houses, you know, they have a front side and a, and a other side, you know, I'm just blocking the front side and then the shadow side, which you can see is um, kind of the tone of the paper. So almost I can, I can leave that. I don't know if this method will work. I, I, I don't usually start off a painting with a stucco roller. I just want to throw myself off a little bit. Um, you learn best when your brain is being thrown off. You know, you don't wanna do the same workout every time. Um, so already you can see light forming, right? Because I'm paying attention to my values. You need very little, okay, to get the impression of something. That's why the impressionist era, you know, people were obsessed with that. You're painting the essence of light. No one was actually really rendering anything, but if you've got your values right, with the, you know, things in more or less the right place, you could get the impression of light fairly fast. And that's what I'm actually very interested in, the abstraction of that, um, more so than, you know, really re uh, render painting. So, um, you know, here I see, you know, some foliage. I'm just going to throw that in there. Um, and then really when I squint, that water and sky are almost identical. So knowing that I can just sort of group this right here. Oh, nice all into one, right? Grouping, okay? I cannot stress to you how important grouping is. If you always, if you take anyone, anything out of any, anything I teach, I always say group and simplify. If you could remember those two things, you're on your way to becoming a better artist than you were yesterday, okay? Grouping and simplifying sounds easy. It's not so easy. Cause like I said, the first thing we tend to do, see, I'm already, I'm already like fanoodling right there. I don't know what I was doing. So, um, so, you know, always remember, how can you, now the boats in the back, oh, it's easy peasy. I'll probably do this later on, but I'm just going to just sort of throw it on to see how that could look like. Now, actually, I'm going to pick something warmer, but this is, um, and I'll show you a piece of time allows of a similar piece I did of uh, a harbor in Netherlands using this technique. So, oh. so already, actually, I kind of want to leave it like that. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, so already we can, you know, we get the gist of things. I can make the brush smaller, maybe add a few light shapes right there. But you see, again, no detail, right? I'm not focusing on detail. You want to focus on getting the essence. What did I just do? Oh, I see. I'm, I'm, I'm redesigning a little bit. I got, I got thrown off myself. Um, and um, I'm going to push this area a little bit more purple with the water um, and then, you know, maybe I could just do a whole brush with a stucco brush. Actually, that might be, do you guys wanna see that? Do you want to see me use one brush? I could try that. Oh yeah, let's do it. Okay. Um, so everyone will have them painted. That's a cool idea. Everyone will be painted differently. And the last one I'll use shape junk and- um, Oh, that, that'd be so much fun. I like that idea a lot. Yeah. Um, that's great. 
So this one was, wait, that is not, oh, you know what? I think I deleted something. That's strange. Are you looking for the bottom right one or which one are you looking for? There you for? go. Oh, that was weird. Okay, so I turned on, no, because that wasn't the final one. Um, so this is an example of using all and basically how I generically start off, which mm -hmm. I'm seeing here. I could push some values even more. Um, and then this one, the one we're working on now is I will just use the Stuco brush. So um, I'm making it very small right now, but actually this is a really fun exercise. You can do this on Photoshop, wherever app you're using um, is just taking the hard brush, which I'd like to do, you know, that hard brush that everyone has, um, and Lip Camarilla does this, and you don't have any opacity. So you're basically putting down like these circle shapes that don't have really have a finesse to them. This is basically what I'm doing, except it has a little bit of texture. So um, very quickly, I can see from a very um, where I am, um, uh, where I'll start overworking it. I want to say overworking because I've talked to Irish people so much now. Um, let me just say that. So you see, I'm just adding those that was already too stagnant. They looked too equal. So I'm just adding some vertical noise, some vertical counter action to vertical to offset that. Now here I'm aware that I actually have to put a deeper shadow. Actually, I can get quite thin with that. I'm actually pretty amazed with this stucco brush. I can get quite, but I don't want to nitpick. I, I kind of get a little bit like where. Tiffany, I want to, do you mind if I pause you just for one second? Um, I wanted to say, um, so we did have a question before uh, one of our participants has to leave that she had asked is, do you always work with this burnt orange, like crimson color in the background, or do you typically use other colors as well? Um, I usually just use this, but you doesn't mean you can't use other colors um, at all. Um, you can definitely use other colors. I have a, I had a friend who would do pastel paintings and he would use um, like blue and it will throw you off though. I typically like to use warmer because you can see now the warm really just gives you a nice vibrancy to the painting, especially for a sunset like this. I'm actually being strategic and primarily because it is a sunset painting and I know those warms will really go through. You see very quickly right away, it's very easy for me to start nitpicking, like very easy. And I know very quickly I already know myself, I'm gonna start not liking for some reason. Um, so it's, I like, like the gesture of it. And so, um, so I I'm, I'm, I'm constantly being aware of that, right? I know, I know it's not a perfect house or anything, um, um, but okay, sorry guys. I'm just really tempted to use this one. Hold on, I just wanna see how that feels like. Um, cause I'm also experimenting, uh, here. Oh no. Texture. Actually, I just love like the smudge of colors that are like capturing that. It, just, it looks awesome. Yeah, I do too, actually. And I'm, and I just learned something. I've never done it. I've never done a painting like this before. You see that green though, that green was too green for the sunset color. So, um, I just wanted to throw in a little bit of like lighter warmth there, but not be too aggressive. Um, but you see, I would call that a simple thumbnail. Um, and, um, you know, I'm still letting some of, let's go back to the endearing stucco roller. I'm still, you know, what was that? Oh, the green is coming from this. Oh, haha, because I turn off the mask. Hey, that's so weird. How come when I turn off this mask, I need to erase this. Okay, there you go. Okay. So last but not least, we'll just, uh, actually wait, hold on, not last but not least. I need to have a clean edge here. So um, this edge is bothering me. So I'll talk a little bit about edges. Like this edge, I feel like needs to be a little bit sharper right there, maybe a little bit. And I'll probably like go through this later, be like, ugh, and like just start maybe seeing things. But for now, I'm just sort of trying to capture. So thinking about that too, but I'm gonna leave it. I'm gonna just move on. Hey, Tiffany, since we're getting close to time, I just want to tell a few of the participants here about some other events we have going on um, yeah. tomorrow. And then we can obviously like carry on because this is awesome. I love this. And I can't wait to see the shape junk. On yeah, I'm going to start that right now. 
Um, so uh, yeah, so tomorrow at nine o'clock, we're going to be doing a ship in perspective because we have a perspective, 3D perspective system that we have in the app. And so we have uh, Peter Sekiewicz, who is going to be building an incredible spaceship in like basically 3D in the app. Um, well, 2D, 3D um, mm -hmm. in the app. It's going to be awesome. Then at one o'clock, we have Theonidas, um, and he is going to be just walking through Infinite Painter and some of the killer features uh, and some of the, the different things that we do um, specifically with the program. So it's going to be like uh, a tour de force of uh, features um, in that. And then um, later on, we have at from seven to nine, which will be really chill and fun. We're gonna, we've joined with a, live, a model group here in Los Angeles. And we're going to be doing a Zoom model session with two models for a figure drawing session. Um, so feel free to join, you know, bring a cocktail or, you know, tablet, traditional media and whatever you want. And we'll have a really good time. So. Wow. You guys sound like you have an awesome. An awesome full day. Um, it, yeah, it's going to be a full day. I'll say that. I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah, guys, check out all the stuff they're having. Um, you know, make, I mean, Infinite Painter is so powerful. Um, and I know I haven't even unlocked, because I'm a simpleton. Uh, I haven't even unlocked, something annoys me with this. I think I almost want to just do that. Um, anyways, I'm going to play around with that a little bit. Because that annoys, that, that how it cuts off like that annoys me. Eh, I don't like that either. Design, this is all just design. I'll play around with that. Um, uh, the last one is um, let's play around with shape junk a little bit. Um, I don't know if I can build a painting just with that because it, there's so much noise and it'll be noisier like that. But what I'll do is I will, um, I'll do textured block Indian ink. Um, so what I'll do first is I will, um, let's see. So I'm actually gonna, start off with just beautiful just look at the myriad of colors i'm gonna start this i love this my boyfriend took this because it's just such a beautiful concoction of grays where you can just really grab and get a holistic color of um oops i don't know what happened um let's make it a little bit lighter so this is in Paris, California. Let's see how I'll get those mountains. So those mountains are very, very, um, um, very subtle value shift from the sky. So we're just going to take that, make it a little bit darker. Oops. Um, and I'm just gonna block in some, like maybe, maybe a little bit more blue like that. Let's see how many people still stay after. Um, I'll try to be quick. Um, no, we so, still, no, you're good, Jen. Okay. And really quick, I'm gonna block in my lightest values here um, just to sort of get an impression of, of that. Um, and then, um, I really like problem solving on the spot. It's just so fun to not know how it's gonna look or come out too. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of scribbling. Oh, thanks Jose. Uh, actually, I'm gonna use the palette knife just for fun. And I'm gonna basically, so you see actually, which is cool. It starts bringing in the background color, which is kind of fun. Cause that really simulates an oil painting where isn't that, or a gouache painting where sometimes that happens. Um, uh, what was I going to do? Okay, so um, let's just go ahead and play with the shape junk a little bit. I'm actually going to hop. I'm going to might be tempted to just do the shape junk for all of it, but uh, like for all my paintings. Um, okay, so let's see. Ooh, that is so fun. Yeah, so I'll point out a bit of what it's doing here. Um, so basically, the brush, the shape junk brush actually. It goes from either a, a square, circle, or try, uh, sorry, or line based on the pressure that Tiffany's using to give so it some. So if I press lighter, noise. it just it goes into the line. 
Yeah. And, and then if you do like a middle pressure, then it's going to do circles. And then a heavy pressure is going to bring you into those, those squares. Yep. Yeah. My iPad screen just, um, my iPad screen just sort of went lighter. So the fun part with this is now I can start because this, this obviously gives you very hard edges, right? Now I can go in and I can start losing. And this is precisely with any brush, not just shape junk. I do this with kind of all brushes. You start getting hard and soft edges if you zoom in with the circles, but then I can lose some of that stuff here. And I love playing around with that, right? So then if I smudge too much, I can go back to the shape junk and I can now play with these randomized shapes. Um, and I can put that, so I never actually use straight white. Right now what I'm using is a lemon yellow and I never actually put straight white into anything. So um, I'm just sort of popping that in right there. And then here as well, just sort of that right here. And I love that you just sort of get this randomized and then it really trains you to really fit. Oh, okay. Why is it smearing? Oh, I, I know. I was going to use also Indian ink as well to show you guys. So now I can sort of use Indian ink as well to sort of finesse maybe some of those shapes. Um, and then go back to, and also notice how I'm holding my brush. I'm holding it and I smudge. I like to almost hold it at the edge because it just gives me more control. Um, but you see, I'm not smudging everything, okay? I'm smudging just a little bit, um, just enough to get, to get my, um, to, to, ha to have that feel of the, the, the light peeking through. Um, maybe what I'll do is I'll use, um, I'll show you how I use the grunge fill tool to now play around with even more different warms and subtle color shifts. So here, Maybe I'll put a little bit of, shoot, that's too purple to me. So I need to actually, this is not gray. It's a very purplish gray. So this is another fun way to sort of put in those. Clouds are hard by the way. So um, I'm struggling with, you know, obviously to get that feel of those clouds is something that I, I struggle with anytime to get that softness and that lightness. But obviously what we're trying to do is Hey, Tiffany, uh, so we had one more hardware related question. Um, do you use any type of screen protector or anything like that on yours? Um, yeah, I use, um, I just messed up there. Um, I use, oh, I forgot, paper-like, I think. Paper-like, yeah, I would also strongly recommend that one too. It yeah. like gives this nice grit, I would say, whenever you're drawing, uh, it makes it feel like you're drawing on paper. Um, so pretty good experience I've had with them. What about you? I think, yes, I think they reached out to me. Um, or was it you that recommended? I can't remember. I can't remember how, but they reached out to me and, and, um, and, 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 I, and I tried it from them and the guy was really nice. Uh, but yeah, I really like it. I haven't had any, any problems at all um, with it. And it definitely, so you see right there, right? Right there is an example of what I, where I need to smudge. So you see, I'm just gonna smudge up like that because I want that lightness to blend in with the rest of the blue, right? So I just want the mountains to barely sort of, um, you know, emerge from that to really get that sort of subtle angelic feel. Um, and then sometimes- wow. I, I, I'm just super impressed the way they're using the shape junk brush in relationship to these clouds. Um, I, I would have never even thought to like approach it that way. Um, but yeah, it's amazing because you're like comboing the shape junk by keeping like edges, but then kind of just breaking up the edges as you go along. And it's just yeah. really awesome. Yeah, so I'm, uh, oops. oh, that pink's kind of cool. Um, yeah, so it's just it's just sort of playing around and finding that sort of, um, because, because like I said with edges, you know, like that would obviously be too hard, but I can see how some of that pink would work. And so when you, when you start to sort of let part of that go and being, you know, very, um, what do you call it? Very um, intentional about it, not just like going crazy and smudging, you know, you can allow for really subtle um, shifts in colors, really subtle, subtle shifts in color without, without losing too much of that. So 
here, I kind of want to, now I want to kind of want to go because it's too soft for me. And I'm very picky about soft edges. You probably can't see in the screen as much, but um, in, in the photo, like you can see at the reference, you know, there's these little peak holes and I, and I, and I need a hard controlled edge for that. So I'm going to go to the, um, I'm going to go back to the grunge fill tool for that because that's probably the brush where I can have the most control and sort of getting these little, these little peak holes that I can, oh, I just want to use my finger to just like smudge it, not paint though, um, to sort of get these little openings. So um, right there, um, right there. And then what I'll do is just very delicately, you see very, I'm just making it very small. I'm smudging one end of it in, into it. So, but careful, cause it can get too streaky. Um, if you if you smudge in the same way, so I have to. I'm using actually the the flat side of it so that you see now, it looks a little bit like not so streaky. Um, so maybe I'll I'll even bring play with bringing my strokes down, like this. Sometimes I'll play around with that, and it'll maybe look like even, you know, a rain like a rain thing or something. Um, that didn't work this time, but, um, and. Yeah, so that's kind of how I would quickly, you know, if I had, you know, 20 minutes for 15, 20. I did like 10 minutes for each of those because I started at 4.30. It's like 10-ish minutes. So yeah, there, yeah, you just kind of knocked them out. I'm, I'm super impressed. Possible. That's, <laughs> I didn't even think I would be that fast, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's possible. Um, this is exactly what I do if I would be going out and plein air painting. Um, this is, this is exactly what I do. I'm just reading the comments really quick um, um, just to see if there's any questions. Okay, it seems like there's just, Peter, are you still there? Um, I wonder if he's still there. Um, but yeah, like now if I were to go back to any of them, it'd be like adjusting values and color, right? So if I were to go back to this one, maybe I could, you know, I'll take the color here and I just make this part like a little bit darker maybe um or actually i would i would make sure that this edge right here is oh what brush am i on oh i saw this too um so i would i would make sure like this is straight so it doesn't look like a leaning house more or less so like things like that right i would i would go back and finesse edges so now we get the semblance that that is sort of a straight ish um, maybe I can, if I can get it in one stroke correctly, it'll look like the indent of house. There you go. Um, so someone like me who does not use rulers and just eyeballs everything, which is not necessarily always a good thing, but at least I train myself to eyeball. If you want to learn good perspective, hit up Peter Paul. Hey, Peter, are you still there? Um, and storyboarding. Um, but, you know, now, now, now I would say it'd be sort of slowing down. So I know there's like bushes in the front. I, I wanted to change that. Oh, there's actually a really interesting dark value there. I want to put in like a greener sort of like dark value there that, oh, that's too dark. See value. That was just too dark. Right. So I needed to control Z that. And, and I wasn't looking at the bigger picture. Um, so this is kind of when, because I've kind of slapped it down and let's say, you know, it was uh, very much, you know, in the planar stuff. If I had time later, which I don't really go back to my planners, but, um, you know, I would start to, you know, sort of um, cut into those shapes a little bit more. How can we cut into and make this bush, you know, figure out tangents, maybe Oh, there's a house there. I forgot there's a teal house. I like that teal house. I'm gonna add it. Um, somehow my eye is very good at taking things out as well. So I won't see things. Um, so there's like a house there and it's, oh, it's a yellow house. Okay, I'm just gonna smush it in there a little bit. Maybe that's too much. I don't know. Actually, that is too much because this isn't reading well. So it's all about the readability, right? You guys can see me screw things up now. That's actually literally what happens every time. I'll paint, I'll be like, oh, I like it. And then I'll screw it all up. Um, so, oops, that was too bright and too green. And that is the process of painting though. You have to learn to be comfortable with that. Oh, okay. So I'm gonna take this value here. I'm gonna carry it on right there. Um, and there's actually, you know, greens at this time are more of a yellowish green. 
So I'm actually really interested in also getting all those beautiful greens without kind of overthinking it too much. So, um, you know, like that. Um, but even in the back here, right, you could add a few of those beautiful dark blue shadows, you know, just to sort of give the hint of shadow and light, right? And they just are shapes, that's it. You're just being a shape maker, right? And just voila, three strokes, it goes, oh yeah, that's a shadow. Your eye doesn't need that much. You don't need to overburden the viewer's eye with a shit ton of stuff. You know, less is more. Probably heard this before. Pertains to portfolios, writing, and other stuff. Um, but, um, you know, it's, what is that? I don't know what that is, um, but I'm taking out that shaft in the front, right? So that's kind of what I would start to, to do. I would probably honestly finesse the, the, the port a little bit more and um you know what I would do okay I broke myself but what I would do is add I like to go with the grunge fill too and add these like little shapes right um maybe even add like a little shape right there to indicate a house um I could easily take this color so once you have your colors right you're basically golden like once you have your colors at the correct value you can just color pick those colors right and you are fine so that's often what happens? I'm going to add just a teeny bit of pink in the sky, just at the horizon right here. Cool. There's still 67 people. All right. Uh, okay. Look at what happens when the value's too dark. You see how that changes everything, the mood and everything, right? That's how important value is. Um, I'm going to push it a little bit pinker, but then I want to, maybe I'll use a textured brush here just to get back that blue that I had, so I almost have the best of both worlds. So a little bit of pink and a little bit of blue. I'm gonna make this just a little bit. Let's see, too blue, too blue, too saturated. So at this point in time, I become very picky with the values, the saturation and everything. I have to control Z that to, I think that put a little bit too much texture. So I'm gonna control Z all that. Um, so maybe something more like this, um, maybe even like that. There is a little bit of warmth in that back thingy. So I'm just going to, my trick is picking the same value while shifting the temperature a little bit. Now you see, we just added a little bit of warmth by there. That is my, that is my secret for everything. Um, even here, just putting in a little bit of, you know, darker shapes, sort of throwing them on. And then maybe, anyways, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not a, um, and then here I could go back to the shape maker, for example, and I kind of want to, I'm kind of going to do something. I should probably save this. I'm probably going to destroy everything, but um, actually, you know what I'm going to do? Dang it. I could duplicate. Hey, so Sean, I can't duplicate this, right? Oh, no. Uh, I sorry. Go, go ahead. What, is, what was the question? I can't do. So if I duplicate this and then I, and I showed how I would smudge this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you could duplicate that. It'll, it'll bring in that mask as well. Is that what the, you're wanting to do? Yeah. I'm just seeing. Okay, cool. So you can see now from this to this, just smudging it a little bit. And I'm like, oh, I kind of like, you know, I'll, I can decrease the opacity and it's sort of like a best of both worlds. So actually our blending or our brushes that pick up paint, um, they actually can do it to where they sample the layers below it, um, which is pretty cool. Um, so you see how just this smudging just brings so much energy. And I actually kind of like that, like that more. Um, it suits more my style. So um, that was quite fun to kind of do. So I just smudged that and I like that a lot better than, than what I had before. Um, I'm going to take the stucco brush and I'm just going to stucco a little bit, I'm holding my brush like this. I'm just gonna stucco a little bit of that beautiful light hitting those rocks right there. Now remember, being mindful of how you put your brush is very important, okay? If you don't know why you're putting down a stroke or how it's gonna fit in, you know, like I said, I, I do work very fast in the beginning, but 
Um, I also am, but I, I also am thinking of how my edges and shapes. I'm just gonna, uh, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm just kind of cleaning up. And I'm not being super accurate about it. Um, I'm gonna cut back in here. I just feel like it needed just one harder uh, edge there or something like that. It doesn't have to be perfect, which is not perfect. So maybe something, I don't know, like that might do. Too bad I can't toggle it, but back and forth. But anyways, I put, I played, while you're gone, Sean, I played with shape junk here and I had a lot of fun with that. And I think I'm a lot happier with. Oh, nice. Yeah, I mean, these are, these are just amazing. I love them. I mean, honestly, it's, uh, I mean, mm -hmm. in one way, I wouldn't even like, these are like at the point to where like, like and you want to make it a full painting how do you like what how do you use these thumbnails for the paintings you just kind of like enlarge and paint over top or do you use them as a reference or how would you approach that that's a really good question um um if i were to use this as a reference um a lot of people have actually told me i need to um, it would just be a matter of slowing down and asking yourself what area of focus do you want that painting to be, right? Because obviously thumbnail is like, you're getting the gist of it, but maybe, you know, you don't necessarily have a hierarchy where one area is more detailed than the other. So I started asking myself, like, for example, in this painting, is it this area I want it to be focused or is it this distant rock right here? Is it the houses in the foreground or is it the back? So asking yourself where you want that area of focus, um, I think would be the first step. And then it would, it would, it would, Kwang Ho once told me, he was like, you have all your answers in your thumbnails. And now the, the challenge is to transfer that into a bigger painting without losing the vitality of that thumbnail. And I still haven't figured that out. Yeah. Um, because very easily you will lose the vitality because when you work bigger, the tendency is to want to, you know, fill every nook and cranny with, um, with, with, you know, detail. Not a detail. And so I've talked with artists before where I'm thinking traditionally, you know, they have things like a paint roller or, you know, some artists will even use their elbow to literally just smudge because you can't get a brush that's big enough. Yeah. And so um, it's, 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 it's actually all the same thing. The only difference I would say is that you're figuring out the hierarchy in your painting as you go bigger and you, and and you um like I can show some examples um as you go bigger and you know not everything can be in equal detail right so I'm trying to find an example maybe that um uh let's see um oh this one was the one that by the way that I painted black and white and I and I had and I had no idea what the colors oh, wow. were out so it was I really love that texture that texture is just amazing yeah that's I the suko that's the suko roller so I just used the same things again um so this is an example of that um and then you can see some of these I've attempted and um let's see um like this would be a good example where oh I know what I was going to show the Boland Dam one um so this one you see how here you're, I'm just losing the shadow and all my texture yeah. is right there, right? So um, you can see I'm playing around with that. Uh, yeah, the rock from the distance. Yeah. Uh, with all the light coming into it. It's like, it just becomes the hero of that scene. It's just absolutely beautiful. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so that's what I would think about if I was going bigger, you know, it would be sort of where's my focus and how can I harness all my energy into the air? Like the background, there's a lot of stuff going on, right? Um, but I just chose to group it basically into one value, a couple of values with different color temperatures. And here you can see in the reference photo, you know, how much more stuff is going on. And then here yeah. I just brought out a few trees and then it was, I did this a lot, but it was just a matter of like too much shapes smudging, too much shape shape until I found that perfect harmony of grouping my shapes and then, um, and, 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 and just bringing out like a few certain areas, like right there, but then this whole part is smudged. You see, oh, I'm smudging right now. Um, so you see, so you see that area right there. Um, so that's the whole thing that I think about all the time when I'm painting. It's, it's, um, you know, like, 
Uh, That's amazing. Like this one, you know, how am I going to tackle people, right? Like this one was an insanely tricky moment. It's like, how am I going to paint all these people? People throw me off. And it was just the grunge fill tool and, and shapes, you know, and, um, and just figure out the light and shadow. I wouldn't have been able to do it other way. But this area you can see is area of rest um, right there. Oh, you can't see, how come, how come, how do I not draw on anything? Um, and then, you know, um, and then on the light here, I have little fract fractal of shape. I like to call it fractal of shape. But then here and the shadow part below it, I'm just smudging, right? Okay, so um, yeah, like right here versus right here. Oh, this is so cool. I love Infinite Painter. Um, okay, so yeah, and then you can see here, you know, not really much detail, but I can, I'm getting just the shadow and light of her face um, and distinguishing what's in the shadow, what's in light. And basically just catching the quick gesture, you can, you can get that like that. Um, and you don't need, you know, much. Um, so uh, yeah, that's, that's how, you know. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's it for the for the demo, um, I might just refine some of it like the, a little bit more, but other than that, it would be like some shapes, but um, that's how I'd approach thumbnails and really awesome. get the essence of it. All right, thank you so much, Tiffany. This was uh, such a pleasure and I, I just love this. And thank you guys for coming. Um, thank you, you know, so I much, guys.